It's the Tyler's Place Podcast, a podcast by brothers for brothers, brought to you by the Supreme Council of the Scottish Rite Southern Jurisdiction. Now, from the House of the Temple in Washington, D.C., here's your host, Maynard Edwards, 32nd Degree. Welcome to the Tyler's Place Podcast. I'm your host, Maynard Edwards. Thank you so much for joining me. Happy 2019 to all my brothers out there. Thanks for coming along on the ride. Podcast at scottishright.org is the email address. Email me anytime. I would love to hear from you. Or check out all those great Scottish Right apps in your app store for free. You can find me on there as well. We begin 2019 with an action-packed show with a couple of huge, huge guests. In a few minutes, we're going to hear from Lieutenant Grand Commander Jim Cole, who's always fantastic to talk to, who's going to tell us about some really exciting stuff coming up in the Scottish Rite. But we begin this episode with two best-selling authors, Brad Meltzer, who we've spoken to on the show many times before, and his co-author, Josh Mensch. They've got a new book out called The First Conspiracy, all about the secret plot to kill George Washington. This happened in the days just before the signing of the Declaration of Independence. It's a fascinating story. And it's a story that no other books have really been written about. They've touched on it. They've circled around it. But it's been such a hard part of history to investigate. No one has written a book about it until now. And I caught up with Brad and Josh over at Politics and Prose, a little bookstore here in D.C., sat down and chatted with them. And I asked Brad... When you look at the library and you see the hundreds and hundreds of books dedicated to George Washington, what makes you want to add to that that pantheon of writing and that that pantheon of literature about Brother George? I mean, I'll just say you can't possibly plan to add to the pantheon. Right, only an egomaniac would be like, "I have my tome; it has arrived." And like I'll somebody write. who's named his TV show after himself. Right, 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 right. <laughs> I thank my agents for that very much. Um, but the, the honest truth is, is all you – all at least I can ever try and do and all this ever was is the same thing I do with our kids' books or with the fiction books, with anything. Is I just want to tell a good story. Um, it wasn't it, – you know, we, we're not trying to win the Pulitzer Prize. We're not trying to win the National Book Award. But it was – it was a mystery to me is I know this person, this amazing man, this Freemason, you know, these – this leader uh, who is – known better than probably any person on the planet, right? He's on the dollar bill. But oddly, we know the least about him as a person. And how do we, and here's a story that I don't know about, and that itself is news to me. Because we know every story. We even know the stories that are fake, the cherry trees and the other things. But to find something you've never heard of was such a novelty that it made me go, there has to be something here. Or even if we don't, why don't we know this story? I mean, either way you come out, it begs the question of, of what the opposite is. So I think it just came out of my love of mysteries and my love of just trying to find an answer. And, and I found for the first time a mystery that I didn't, you know, no one seemed to have a modern answer to. Josh, as, as someone who has done the, the pulling on the threads of history to, to see where they lead, how difficult was it to find this thread? This was something that was deliberately hidden. So this was something you guys state right off, right away in the book. You, you begin with, a, 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 I don't know if it's a preface or an introduction. I forget which part because I'm listening to it. So um, you begin by saying, listen, this is, you know, this was something that was meant to be covered up. This is why it's so hard to find. How do you start that process? Well, first of all, um, uh, we do want to take our hats off to all the many great writers and authors and historians who have written about George Washington. So everything we do is is because so many other great people have written books um, and have studied the history. Uh, but it's a great question. And, and we just really started with finding things that we were surprised by and we found fascinating and saying, how the hell did this happen? How did this happen? And then following the trail. And it is it does start to feel like detective work uh, doing historical research because you're putting together, you're, there's a lot of conjecture, you're putting together theories of the case, you're looking for evidence in different places, diving through these really dense, long historical tomes uh, and trying to find clues, trying to find hints, and then piecing things together, creating timelines. It's kind of like in the in the detective shows where there's the big board, the mort- murder board. It's it's kind of like that when you're researching history, trying to put the clues together. So Brad, did you run into sort of a nonfiction snobbery where where guys who you know they look at you know oh, it's Brad Meltzer, he writes thrillers, he's a, he's a, he's that guy that does the kids books and he does the the House of Lies and the or the how the Book of Secrets, the House of Lies, all those things. Did you run into authors when you were 
researching this who, who sort of dismissed you as your ability to go after this, or was it a, an open environment? No, I listen. Uh, you know, we had someone here tonight who was like, you know, asking us questions, but those are rightful questions. I mean, I don't think anyone should be putting out something um, that is trying to add to this, you know, this this man's history without you to expect to not be challenged on some level. But but as far as the snobbery or, you know, why are you doing this, I, I think maybe 10, 15 years ago, it was very stay in your lane. Like if you wrote thrillers, you were a thriller writer. You wrote comics, you were a comic writer. You wrote kids books, you continue writing kids books. Um, and then I remember just going like, why? Why why can't you try the other way? And 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 I've been just lucky enough, um, and especially with, with all, you know, Masons around the country, they're the number one group uh, beside my family members in Florida who come up to me and say to me, listen, you know how people have told our story as Masons? You're the only one who actually sits and takes the time and talks to us like human beings and, and spends time and, and, and doesn't just make us out to be the bad guy of every movie. So thank you, right? I mean, that's amazing to me. Uh, and I think when you tell these stories, uh, you, you're going to get a little bit of both. You're going to get people who come out and support you for that because they love it. And there's going to be people who come out and say like, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? That's called being a human being, right? You're going to always meet both sides, but um, I, w- I would expect no less, uh, no matter what the work is. You mentioned this. You touched on this a little bit in your sit down here with C-SPAN that we're doing at uh, Politics and Prose. You said that family members are, are the ones, like you, the two of you, worked on lost history, and you, you found a lot of lost artifacts, Hitler's diary, the 9/11 flag, et cetera, et cetera. And family members contact you and say, "This is our family history. This is what we know." How do you decide which ones of those? And this is for both of you guys. I know you guys have both done this various. How do you decide which ones are – because we get kooky calls of people, oh, my grandfather was in the Illuminati. Can I stop by and pick up my family gold? And that's a, they're, they're serious when they call. How do, you, how do you riffle through that, Josh? Well, quickly, on, on the show Lost History that Brad and I did together, we actually had uh, someone from the FBI who was the head of their art crimes unit helping us separate the so crazy – calling the big guns. Yeah, exactly. Oh, he's and an they, expert, yeah. Yeah, they, and, and you know, he often said to us like a lot of it is gut at first. He can tell right away if something is totally bonkers. But you get a feeling for something when it feels legitimate and you just develop a sense and that's where you start. And then once you start with that sense, then you start to dig deeper and, and kind of investigate and interrogate and see whether there's something legitimate there. Right. No, and listen, when you do a show called Decoded um, <laughs> on TV or Lost History, no one gets crazier email than me. Nobody, right? People bring me the holy grail at my book events. Um, I've literally had people come to me and say, would you like to see the Holy Grail? I'm like, well, you brought it all the way to this Barnes & Noble. You might as well show it to me, right? <laughs> um, and if you want to know where the Holy Grail is, it is in the Los Angeles Barnes & Noble. It is located on the shelf between uh, Melville and Meltzer. So oh, great. you find that it's right there if you need the regenerative powers of the Holy Grail. Um, but the reality is I also, you know, the people that get the craziest email, if you have a crazy story to tell, you you, you email Jesse Ventura or email me. Um, and we do very different things, right? Right, yeah, sure. But... But we've been also very lucky. We had um, the family of John Wilkes Booth, who, of course, famously shot Abraham Lincoln. Their lawyer contacted me, um, said, hey, I represent the family of John Wilkes Booth. Everyone and every history book will tell you that 12 days after John Wilkes Booth shot Abraham Lincoln that he himself was shot dead. And this is the family. They have a story to tell. Um, The story is that he was actually not killed. Uh, They got the wrong guy. They have the proof of it. He escaped. He went on the run. They have his new identity. Would you like to hear their story? Yes, I want to hear that story, yes, right? I'll you stop take what the I'm call, doing. Right? Exactly. Take the call. Um, and, and we actually did that as an episode of Decoded. Uh, and I, 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 to this moment, believe that everything they told us, they believe to be true. Um, but it was also fascinating because, you know, one of their the, – the fake identities he took up was John B. Wilkes. And if your name is John Wilkes Booth, and your fake name is John B. Wilkes, you're the worst fake ID maker <laughs> than since when I got my fake ID, you know, back in uh, the 80s. Um, but, you know, there are things that fall apart. And, and, and as Josh said, very quickly you get a sense of uh, – I, I, I forgive my French, but it's like a, what we call in my house a BS meter, you know. And you just can kind of feel when it's the crazy and when it's something that you actually need to pay attention to. But I will say I found some of my best stories – from those. Um, and I found one of them. I remember uh, there was a woman at a book signing and stood up and she, she, I was talking about my love of Superman, what Superman stands for in American history and what he stands for, what we can all achieve and what we can be. 
And she stood up and she said, I know more about Superman than you. And I'm like, well, that's not really a question. Um, and so she said, no, I do. And I said, well, how do you know them? And she says, because he, the guy who created Superman, Jerry Siegel, was my uncle. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. You know, and, then, and then right as she says that, another 90-year-old man stands up at the signing and says, I was in the army with Jerry Siegel. And, you know, whatever you believe in in the universe, whether it's God or, you know, providence or whatever it might be, but that maker up there, I, you, I knew in that moment, I'm like, that's a, take the message. Listen to the universe when it sends you a message. And I said to both of them, can I have your phone numbers? And uh, she said to me, I have a mystery about my uncle. Uh, and did you know that his father was shot and killed in a crime? And I wrote it down, and I wrote her back year, uh, months later, and it was true, is that the guy who created Superman, Jerry Siegel, that months before uh, he created Superman, his father died, had a heart attack during a crime. I know this book. Right, you know this book. And, and all the years that they asked Jerry Siegel, where did you get the idea for Superman? In all the years he gave interviews, he never once says, my father died in a crime, and then weeks later I created a bulletproof man. That's a key piece of information that's missing. And we got to put that story out there because I listened to this 90-something or 80-something-year-old woman who I just had the gut was telling the truth. And I went and followed up. I went to visit her whole family in Cleveland. I met Jerry Siegel's wife who was based on Lois Lane. I've met multiple presidents. I was never more nervous than when I got to talk to the real-life Lois Lane. And she said to me, you know, Brad, no one knows these stories we're telling you. And I said, why? And she says, because no one's ever called us but you. And I just had yeah, – I followed my gut. And so to me, you can go down the rabbit hole the wrong way. You can go down the rabbit hole the right way. But when you find the good one, I do believe, you know, as in everything in life, you know, 90 percent of it can be garbage. But that 10 percent that's gold is amazing. I am encouraged as a, as a student of history, as a fan of history, as a Freemason, as a, as a dad. When I look at bookshelves, when I look at TV now, when I look all over the place, history is freaking hot. I mean, it is everywhere. Every, I mean, your book, Bill O'Reilly's all over the bestseller list with, with history books. History is hot. That's got to feel kind of good to you guys as well as, as storytellers of history. Josh? Sure. Well, one thing that's great about history and studying history is, A, it's infinite. You can study history forever because every time period is so complicated and there's always more stories out there. And every generation finds a new way to tell the same stories and finds new information. Um, so, uh, it, But it's so great that history is getting more popular now because, as we said earlier, uh, now, at a time of political division and discord and confusion and chaos, uh, looking back to history can be one of the most illuminating things to try to understand where we are now. And, um, and you, there's always something to learn. There's always something entertaining. There's always something fascinating uh, when you study history. Um, and we both love American history so much. And hopefully we'll keep writing about it. And hopefully people will keep reading it. Well, I think so. The book is, is fascinating. I'm, I'm, I'm a, I do audio books because I have like a two-hour drive here in DC traffic so uh, that's that's where I get a lot of my book um, I do want to say this to you Josh I know you know how cool Brad is but I'm going to tell you exactly how cool he is um, I'm doing this interview for the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry which is a part of the Masonic family and we have a charitable organization called Rite Care and what we do is we bring in kids free of charge all over the country at our many clinics and we help them with speech and language disorders and for a guy who tells stories that's a really important thing and so Brad has helped us out uh, his book, his children's book, I Am George Washington, which is fantastic and has a little George Washington Masonic apron in there. He's helping us out by some of the proceeds from that are going to help Scottish Rite Care. And, and it's just a really cool thing that he's doing. So, I, Brad, I just want to say uh, thank you, first of all. And, and what brought you to this? Um, you know, the honest truth is, is uh, years ago, I did a book, as you know, on Freemasonry. And, uh, and I remember at the time, you know, that was... It, we all, you guys, to say history is hot, right? So is Freemasonry, right? And, and when we met uh, and I met meeting great people like Dean Alban uh, so many years ago, it was like I think 15 years ago almost, it was a time where everyone said that you were, you know, taking over the White House and, and stealing everyone's car. They blamed everything on Freemasons. And it was a very similar thing to what happened uh, with Lois Lane when I met her as I went – and went down the Scottish Rite headquarters and said, can I just talk to you and meet you? And, and, and I think they were almost shocked. They're like, what do you mean? And I said, I, I wrote a book about you guys. would love you to read it. And they said, well, everyone makes us the bad guy because it was the time of kind of those kinds of books. And, and uh, I said, well, why don't you want to read the book? And they're like, you're going to let us read it first? I'm like, yeah, read the book. And I said, and, and if you like it, you'll call me back. And they read the book. I sent three copies before it ever was released to the public. 
And I sent it down to Scottish Rite headquarters. And my phone rang a week later, and they said, we like your book. Um, we really appreciate what you say in here, and you got your facts. And uh, that's how we first got involved with, uh, with Freemasonry. And, and then we've been telling their stories on, um, on er- just about every TV show we've done uh, and, in, and in many more of my books. And, yes, it is true. And no one knows this but the Freemasons, but we did hide uh, Freemason references in I Am George Washington. I remember yeah, Dean man. Alban said to me, he's like, you put us in there? I'm like, let's see if you can find it, my friend. And he's like, I saw it. I saw it. And, uh, and we did it as a thank you because they were just nice, amazing people. And everywhere I go on my book tour uh, – whether it's the nonfiction, whether it's the fiction, anything else, there are all these Masons who come out and just and, and show uh, that amazing generosity of spirit. And so how could we not help by paying back with those amazing causes that you support? Well, the book is uh, The First Conspiracy, The Plot to Kill. I know there's some – I've, I've heard three different titles the tonight. The to Secret kill. Plot to Kill George Washington. Yes. And uh, we'll uh, – we're going to talk more about that, bradmeltzer.com. And uh, I, I just want to thank you guys for being so gracious and giving us so much of your time. So, Brad, thank you very much. We'll see you soon. Thank you, sir. Really good to see you. And thank you to everyone who always comes and supports Thank you, sir. Josh, thank you very much. Appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming. Again, the book is called The First Conspiracy by Brad Meltzer and Josh Mensch. Fantastic book. Can't recommend it enough. As far as whether or not there are any Masonic references in the book, well, I'll let you read it yourself to find out if there's any winks or nods to Freemasons anywhere in the book. You can pick it up wherever great books are sold or visit bradmeltzer.com for that or any of Brad's fantastic books. From the House of the Temple in Washington, D.C., this is the Tyler's Place. Lieutenant Grand Commander Jim Cole joins me now to talk about some of the things that have happened in the past and some of the things that are coming up in the future for Scottish Rite. You know, here at the beginning of the year, it's always a good time to reflect on the past and to look forward as to what's coming up. So, Lieutenant Grand Commander, thanks for joining me as we reflect on 2018. Share a couple of your thoughts with me. You know, here we are, 2019, looking back at the year that was. G- give me some of the things that you're you're thinking about now. Well, in, in looking at, at 2018, it seems to me that some of the steps that we have been putting in place have started to bear fruit. Um, when you look at... Uh, during the year of 2018, as we look back to 2017 and accumulated the, the statistical results of 2017, it became clear that many of the things that we were doing were supported by the, by the numerical evidence, as it were, among membership. But even more especially, uh, some of the individual uh, and anecdotal evidence that we see uh, of some of the enthusiasm levels and some uh, at the events, at the meetings, some of the discussions among the council members as to uh, the fact that they're, they're bragging about, well, this valley is, is doing this and is doing that. And some of our efforts are starting to take hold. Uh, one of the things that, that I think we need to be very mindful of is continuing uh, those efforts because when you're dealing with people, when you're dealing with membership, uh, it it takes a continued effort. Um, it can take uh, multiple perspectives as we deal with them to to try to meet their needs. And a lot of times in trying to meet their needs, we're still trying to determine their needs and their wants and desires. And sometimes until you enter into that communication in a regular recurring manner it's difficult to perceive what is needed out there so i see it in a very positive light Uh, i'm very optimistic based upon 2018 uh, as we go forward Uh, the workshops in 2018 i thought were extremely um, energetic Uh, there was a great deal of motivation and uh, drive that came from those workshops as members left uh, I've I've really never in in my Masonic career been approached at the end of events like that so often by people saying, "Well, I really like this, I really like that," and pointing out specific items in those workshops that many people said pretty much the same thing that they were really on target for what they wanted, and that they were the most beneficial that they had had. So. 
So we took that and, and are looking forward to rolling some of those ideas that we learned forward into the next series of workshops. As you get into the process of planning these 2020 workshops, even though you're a pretty good distance out, what have been some of your major goals in terms of those workshops? One of our major goals was to put these workshops in place as quickly and as early as possible. We put together a task force appointed by the Grand Commander, uh, a, a small work group, as it were, to plan the 2020 workshops uh, and we have really had some great success in that. We have the agenda uh, pretty much finalized. We have uh, all but a couple of speakers already committed. Um, we know the locations, and I will tell you, share with you that the locations are going to be Sacramento, St. Louis, and Charlotte. Uh, right now, we're trying to finalize the actual dates, but the hotels that have uh, presented bids to us are in the March 15th to May 1st time frame. Uh, we are trying to, to work uh, the workshops into that time frame. We anticipate that uh, by probably sometime in February, we'll be able to publish the dates and, and the entire holdup right now is simply waiting for the contracts to come from the hotels. One of the things we've done this year, even in working with, with the hotels, is to say, give us the best price uh, within this time slot. Instead of going and saying, we want you on the third weekend of March, we're having all of these hotels bid for, for their top two or three weekends within that period. We think, number one, it will allow us to have the, the most efficient use of our finances. Um, but secondly, it will streamline the process uh, rather than than taking a date and then having to work around other things and then go to the next hotel and then trying to set a date and so forth. So we've streamlined that process. Uh, we already are, are pretty close to narrowing it down to the actual hotels in those cities. Uh, I know we, we pretty much have the answer in Charlotte and We've got it down to two within St. Louis, uh, and, and we're closing in in Sacramento as well. But it will be those locations uh, in the March, basically from the middle of March through the month of April. It will be those three weekends in that period. Uh, in general, the agenda will follow a, a similar timetable, although the topics uh, will be certainly will be fresh. Uh, we will have. Uh, a pre-conference or pre-workshop session on Friday morning um, dealing with Sentinel and at the same time we will have the 2020 fellows uh, will have an opportunity to meet with the uh, uh, Grand Commander at that time. Then we will officially begin in early afternoon on Friday. It will run through Saturday at approximately uh, 4 or 4.30 p.m. Can you share with us a little hint about some of the topics that are being considered for those workshops? Some of the topics uh, that have already been determined will, for instance, one of the things we want to focus on is, is passing on the tools for leadership among our members so that we can make sure that that our future leaders, as well as particularly highlighting our newer leaders, those who have moved into the leadership roles recently, to make sure that they're equipped with the proper tools for their job. Um, some of the topics include, for example, technology areas such as cybersecurity, um, what to do if, if your information, perhaps uh, at the valley level, were, were hacked, so to speak, uh, how to use social media to effectively market your events and activities, as well as to market who your organization is to the world, potentially in the recruitment of new members and so forth. Um, also to, to look at, we're going to have one session that I think we've so far referred to as uh, gadgets and gizmos, uh, new technology, including new apps that will enable you to better uh, lead your valley and uh, better uh, enhance your membership uh, opportunities. Uh, we also are going. We have a speaker confirmed to discuss uh, 
leadership qualities that are necessary for Masonic leadership and how to enhance those qualities and how to pass along those qualities, the, the whole concept of passing tools along for leadership. Uh, we're going to have a session on how to successfully plan either a presentation, a workshop, a conference, or even an event in the Valley so that we can, whether it's a, a dinner to raise money or, or a dinner uh, to uh, allow us to host non-members or whether it is simply making a presentation such as at the workshops, we want to provide people with those skills we want to encourage them to be able to do those things, to effectively run meetings, to know how to, uh, for example, we'll talk about planning for the workshop and how we did that and some of the how you can transport those techniques to planning a successful reunion, for instance, to planning special events in your valleys. So, again, we want to equip people with those skills. In terms of leadership, is there an area of focus that the workshops may touch on as, as a, I guess, a little tidbit that, that you definitely want to make sure everybody walks away with. As a leader, understand what makes our organization different than the other competing organizations out there. In other words, why be in Scottish Rite in, instead of or in addition to uh, Kiwanis, the Lions Clubs, uh, Rotary, uh, organizations such as that, uh, certainly, uh, we have members uh, in Scottish Rite that are members of those organizations, but we need to be able to distinguish ourselves and say, why would I want to use my time? So we're going to have, in fact, that's going to be, uh, will likely be our keynote uh, address, uh, what is the, why Freemasonry as opposed to other groups? Uh, we also are going to have an open dialogue on Friday evening uh, with Art De Hoyas. Uh, art has uh, art has committed to that it's always uh, well received so we're t- and, and there it will simply be uh, anything you would like to discuss with art his perspectives on uh, uh, it might be esoteric topics it might be on uh, the collections in the house of the temple it might be on masonic history but we'll simply allow dialogue there and again that is looking at empowering our our future and new leaders with knowledge and skill sets uh, that will enable them to lead by example and to discuss with people uh, uh, some of these topics that maybe you always wanted to know something and they pick up that information there, then they can pass it along. And, and people look to their leaders for uh, to be a repository of, of certain levels of information. So this will be an opportunity to address that side as well. Brothers, keep your eyes on ScottishRite.org and on the Scottish Rite Journal for more details about the 2020 workshops. They're going to come out earlier than ever before, so we want to make sure you're on that ahead of time to make sure as many guys can be a part of those 2020 workshops as possible. We got such a great response from the 2018 workshops. We don't want that momentum to slip away at all. My thanks to Lieutenant Grand Commander Jim Cole for joining us here on the Tyler's Place podcast. This is the Tyler's Place. That is going to wrap it up for the Tyler's Place podcast, January 2019 edition. Don't worry, Art DeHoyas and Mark Oldno will return to their regular segments next month on the podcast. We had just such huge guests. I wanted to make sure I gave them every available minute, and we're out of time. So make sure you join us for February, the triumphant return of Mark and Art here on the Tyler's Place podcast. Until then, podcast at scottishright.org to answer any and all of your questions about the show. We would always love to hear from you. I'm your host, Maynard Edwards. Thanks for joining me. I'll catch you next time right here on the Tyler's Place. If you're interested in becoming a Freemason or in joining the Scottish Rite, email us at podcast at scottishright.org.